in a world where Microsoft virtualization is still considered to be the underdog by some. The Hyper-V Amigos enlighten the IT crowds on how they could very well be mistaken. Hi Didier, how are you? Hello Carsten. I'm just fine. I'm in my lab with my buddy. So, what <laughs> so we welcome all of you for the 19th episode of the Hyper-V Amigos and uh, this time we are back back to backup, right? Back to backup because it's more important than ever. I keep hearing these horror stories about people being hit by ransomware and whatnot, <laughs> and it's not pretty. It's not pretty at all. It's not pretty. So no. back up. And no matter what you're doing in IT, whether it's IoT, classical virtualization, even hardware, I don't care. I mean, you have to back up your data. That's something that's not changing, whether you're in the cloud or still in the 90s somewhere with a with a COBOL frame mainframe running in the in, in the in the base, <laughs> basement it's fine as long as you back up your data right yeah, I, I hear some stories about uh, running uh, the, although there is an initiative to uh, let uh, COBOL software run in Azure to um, get away from mainframes I heard recently but Azure is not our topic here so <laughs> let's dive into our setup because we have a yeah. multiple series planned um, so this is part one of our series and we hope we we can deliver on that promise right <laughs> yeah that's that's the intent at least so the intentions we, are good the intentions are there with further no further ado or how they do they say we we switch to our setup so yep. um let's first explain what we are doing um we are we want to back up um with our favorite backup software so far so uh, you have something on your on your sweater written and i have something here written we are not oh, really? uh, we are not uh, only mvps microsoft mvps we are also uh, veeam vanguards right what a, and... what a coincidence I, I had no idea i was wearing this, I mean, this like... <laughs> so and uh, we want to back up an s2d a two node s2d cluster to a single single node right yes that's basically the first setup so uh, forgive us this is not a, a, a 60 node cluster because somebody has to pay for the hardware and <laughs> yes. that happens to be Carsten and he's from Germany so I don't think they have much money in Germany anymore so it's a two node cluster anyway so <laughs> yes. just 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 no it is my it is my small uh, four node data on cluster uh, um, and we split it up in a two node s2d cluster and we need something to backup on right so yeah so one node is the backup target that we are going to use today it's standalone so that's one scenario and the other node the fourth node will, will come into play in another part of this series when we are actually backing up to a cluster an s2d cluster uh, to showcase some uh, concerns we might have with backing up to a file share, but that's for that's for later. Anyway, we have to make you with four nodes. That's first world problems, you know. But yeah. there are limits. <laughs> Maybe next time uh, uh, we can also have some more nodes. Uh, not next time. We want to compare the numbers to to back up the same setup to uh, one. Um, a single host uh, with storage spaces, not with a fancy RAID controller with a lot of cash, just storage spaces. And in the next episode, we want to back up to an uh, to an S2D cluster um, with a scale out file server on it. Maybe yeah. also something else. But uh, let's talk about this setup. So we have our two machines here. Yeah, you you see we have uh, on the screen. I have deployed um, ten. VM fleet VMs on each node, and you may uh, see 10 is missing. For that, I have a 11. So uh, each VM has around 100 gigabyte of uh, storage that it use on on the CSVs. So we have two CSVs uh, where our VMs are uh, living, and I have a minor load running. So um, I think we used VM fleet to let, let me show you to get 100 IOPS per second per VM. So it's not too fancy, but the VMs are creating some churn, right? Yeah, so they're not totally idle. Exactly. 
So, and um, they are running. You see here. And you can yeah? actually see the stats over there. Yeah. Yeah. Let me push this window a little bit down because we have we have to have some place for our faces. That would be here, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> and there's not much going on on the network. So, um, let's switch to our target machine, BD. Okay. So um, here we, it's it's just um, it's just a system with some disks in there, disks and uh, also uh, SSDs. So let's do a get physical disk, and we have um, two um, NVMEs, but these are not used in this design. This this will be caching devices in an S2D setup. And then we have, I think, two. Are they two SSDs? Here is one, and there's another one. You've got and more, yeah. Now we have only two, and then we have six HDDs. So uh, two, um, let's say, 800 gigabyte SSDs. These are used, and then uh, six one terabyte HDDs. This is our target, and. Yeah. Why did we choose SSDs and HDDs, DDA? Well, we, we want to demonstrate uh, what they call mirror accelerated parity now, what used to be called uh, multi-resilient volumes. Yeah. But the idea is that you have uh, multiple tiers in the same volume and that all your writes go to that uh, performance tier, not to the capacity tier. So it, it will only just start pushing down the data to the capacity tier when it gets to a certain percentage uh, when it's too full, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, and that would give you the optimal performance for those backups coming in to land on that fast tier, while it can just offload that data to the capacity tier all day long. You don't really care. It's not that, uh, let's say, time-specific or performance-specific as your backups. So for the backups, we're, we're really trying to find a way to ingest as much uh, backups as possible on a single target. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have some challenges going on nowadays, uh, especially in my environments where, where I work, is that uh, the cost of the rack units with the hosters has become ridiculously high. Mm -hmm. And it actually makes a lot of sense to try to pack as much capacity or, or whatever you need into the, the smallest possible f uh, form factors because you want to save on those rack units. That literally can save you many tens of thousands of euros per year or hundreds of thousands of euros over the lifetime of the hardware, five or six or whatever years. Mm. Uh, and for that, we have a challenge, of course. It's, it's quite easy to pack a lot of performance in a small uh, size. Uh, and you do that with SSDs or NVMEs. Uh, the point is, do you get the capacity? Well, the good news is today you do, actually. If you have a 24 base in a, in a, in a two-unit server and you put, let's say, 24 NVMEs or 24 SSDs or a mix of those in there mm -hmm. at, uh, what, what are the sizes today? 3.4, 3.2, but also 6.4, uh, 7.4, and even 8 terabyte uh, NVMEs exists, and even larger SSDs. Of course, they're, they're quite expensive, but I think they are not, let's say, too expensive to make this experiment worthwhile. Mm -hmm. uh, and then all of a sudden you can get uh, 80, 100 or more terabytes of very performance storage at very low latency in a two unit, uh, two rack unit uh, form factor. So if you can make do with two or three or four of those, all of a sudden you might have saved yourself uh, uh, 100,000 or 200,000 euros over the, the hardware lifespan. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, this won't this won't be for the case for everybody. If you have your own data center or you have a very cheap data center where you can put, let's say, all you can eat and it doesn't cost you a bundle, uh, it might be more cost effective to go with more with HDDs. But the, the, the problem with HDDs is that to get the performance, the IOPS and the latency you need, you need lots of them. Yeah, and then it becomes counterproductive to use very large ones, unless, of course, you are building uh, backup as a service as as uh, as a, a at scale. That's yeah. a different story. But if you are if you're working for smaller entities, then that's a problem because then you have to almost willingly use smaller disks but put more in, and that's fine if you don't have to pay per rack unit. You only pay for the 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 power you consume. But if you start paying per rack unit 
no matter what is running in there. I mean, I could put a cooking plate in a rack unit and let it work all day and create heat and, and drive up the cost of cooling. But for my <laughs> rack unit, the price would be exactly the same, right? So, uh, <laughs> that's, that's anyway, nice. this, this, it's it's actually it is like what we do today. We we put servers in there and they create heat right it's like a cooking yeah. plate you're burning yeah, but, kilowatts and getting but, but some... a cooking plate would be worse a cooking plate would be worse so <laughs> so depending on on the economies of the situation you are in it might make make a lot of sense to try and build very compact very high performing high capacity yeah. backup systems and basically that's what we're doing okay and, and also take in mind that you don't really have to use this for your entire backup capacity. This could also just be your uh, premier tier where you put the first days or the first week of data mm -hmm. and then you, you you migrate it off or copy it off to... to Maybe to the cloud even, huh? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Why not? I mean, it, 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 it's all possible. Yeah. Uh, but that's this, that's that's why we are working with this. This this doesn't mean Karsten and I have gone completely crazy or won the lottery and don't know what to do with our money anymore, and we want to put everybody on NVMe backup targets. But it's kind of interesting to test these things and think about the pricing and where it makes sense and what it can do for you. Yeah, and, uh, uh, the and prices, you uh, Didier, the prices really came down, right? The prices really came down. Of course, if you if you're going to compare, let's let's say an enterprise uh, grade uh, at least 7,200 or 10k, uh, eight terabyte HDD, it's going to be around 400 or euros perhaps. But if you look at the NVMEs, and I think I have a, a price uh, from a Belgium or Dutch price uh, site here for uh, some of these NVMEs. So let's see what I have here. Uh, 1869 euros for 8 terabyte uh, NVMe from Intel. Unbelievable. I was just doing the same on the screen. Uh, yeah. we, we didn't uh, orchestrate that. So I did the same. Uh, this is a German price. We have 1922 uh, euros for 8 terabyte NVMe and that's not a bad one. It's not a caching device of course. I think it's a, it has a DV, DVPD from 0 0.8 but as a backup target it's still very good and in Germany we have the prices including the VAT so uh, so yeah. if you are a company you can deduct the the VAT and uh, it's around seven sixteen hundred euros and that's not cheap of course but you get a lot of storage and very fast storage right so Let me close well, we, we, we did the price calculation and for us it just makes sense we, we actually save money by doing it yeah. Because because we have to pay so much for the rack unit. Right? Yeah. So but uh, but anyway, let's let's go on. So you are in a special situation where you have to pay for the rack uh, the 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 the, uh, the rack space per month, and yeah. so you want to go of course as dense as possible. For others yeah. that might be maybe not uh, not being the case, so they can take huge servers. Yeah. So, but let's let's explain the technical setup a little bit more. So here we, I show you the tiers on our single host. It's it, it doesn't have a RAID controller. It's just storage spaces on a single node. And you see here we have done a a huge um, volume. In this scenario, it has 3.4 terabytes of usable space, and it has a part of it is in SSDs, and a part of it is in HDD. Right? Yeah. And yes. we can show that. If we open Perfmon here, and by the way, Didi uh, told me, I didn't know that, if you do uh, a Perfmon uh, space slash this, you can, you can save the settings, right? And I do that yep. extensively now. So thanks to you, Didi. Didier. You're welcome. Um, so here, you, here we see um, our virtual disk, and it has an SSD tier. And we, we will see later the numbers when we do our backups uh, here. Yeah. And we have an HDD tier. Yeah. yeah, and maybe it's interesting to point out that as long as you have enough free space in that SSD tier, everything, whatever you do, everything lands in the SSD tier. Mm -hmm. And the moment the SSD tier reaches a percentage, which is, I think, 85 uh, by default, 
uh, it will start pushing data to the capacity tier. But whatever you do, you write to the the, the performance tier. Right? Yeah. So we will we will show that in the video, or a little bit later, right? So here yeah. we have our it's a normal system. We have our operating system on C, and then we have a storage space on M. We only have one. If we look into that, we have two directories, and we have one that's called backup shared uh, share for SMB3, and we have a backup, backup directory for mover. That's not quite consistent, but yeah. uh, we want to show two possible backup scenarios. Yeah. Yeah. So the the data mover is basically the what what Veeam does for you. It's its native way of uh, moving data, uh, and that's what you'll have when you create a backup target, uh, a repository on a server that has local disks attached. Uh, no matter how you attach the disk, whether it's uh, iSCSI, SAN, or or really local disks, but you could also create a, a file share, an SMB3 file share, and present that as a target. And basically, what we did is we presented the same backup. Uh, storage uh, in two different ways mm -hmm. once as a backup uh, uh sorry as a file share and once as a as just a, a repository local location for veeam so the data mover can uh, kick in uh, we can show this in veeam yeah oh, so yeah you have the mouse you to, if you want to no i have the mouse so let's try it, let's yeah. try it. Yeah, go to backup infrastructure and we go to backup repositories you will see you have the default, of course, which we never use. And then you have the data on SDD4 backup share for SMB3, which is basically pointing to the file share we exposed on that M drive in that system. And we have the data mover, which is just pointing to the drive letter. And that means we can compare both ways of doing the backup. Uh, what we're interested in is uh, we are going to hammer the system. Uh, our, our poor little two node cluster, we are really going to do too many backups to be healthy. Uh, you have to tweak this in real life, but at this moment we are interested in generating as much backup traffic as we can, so we'll, we're just gonna hammer the, 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 the source, and then we're gonna send backups to the target, and then we want to see how, how well that target can handle what's coming at it. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to figure out uh, if we walk along this path with our NVMEs and SSDs, uh, will the CPU scale us? Uh, what, what's, what, what problems could we run into? That's what we want to know. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's not that you could not build this with a, with a rate controller. You, if it's a very good rate controller, you, you most certainly can, but then adding NVMEs and STDs into the mix becomes a bit more problematic. Uh, the nice thing about the storage spaces uh, approach is that you have the uh, multi-resilient volume or the mirror accelerated parity, as we call it now, it's built in, you can leverage it. Mm -hmm. And that makes it kind of interesting uh, to see what it can do. Now, the risk you could run there is, are the CPUs going to be taxed too much because it has to handle all the storage IO? Uh, there is no controller and there is no controller caching involved. So is that a problem or not? Well, it's, uh, it's different ways to, to achieve the same goal. And the question is, is it a valid way? And that's what we're interested in. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're going to do. And of course, we've set up some backup jobs. If we go to home, so we have two CSVs, CSV1 and CSV2, and we have two jobs for each CSV, two with the data mover and two with the SMB3. So we can kick those off, generate a load, and look at how the target is behaving in regards to throughput, speed, uh, CPU, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we're going to do for you today. Okay, then let's maybe start with the with a backup job because it takes some time. Yes. And then we can explain let's, a little bit more. Let's kick up the data mover. No, not all two. No. <laughs> can let's, you get them? I can get them. No, there we go. Okay. Not I'm gonna do an active full, right? full. Yeah, because we want some data to be pushed over the network. So the thing that we need to keep an eye on is our backup target. We want to see the CPU. We want to see the network over here. It's a RDMA network. Of course, with the data mover, that is not going to be used. But we did uh, specify to uh, to Veeam that it should pref preferably use the uh, the RDMA networks. Mm. And then we will have a look at what's happening on those disks. But of course, the backup first has to kick off, and there's all kinds of preparational work to be done as 
every Veeam or backup user will know. It just doesn't start like that. It has to prep, it has to create checkpoints, it has to set up the target, it has to start processing the data. But it's working and it's going to go places. Mm -hmm. You were just on the on the target. To to be fair, uh, people have maybe seen we have uh, four uh, SMB adapters there, and uh, it's oh you. you oh, how good? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let me grab the mouse. Okay, grab the mouse. So I wanted to go to the target. Yeah. yeah. If you look here, we have four network cards, and uh, there are two Hyper-V cards that do RDMA or uh, virtual cards on the on a Hyper-V switch and to real um, physical adapters. So on this yeah. setup, this is a Hyper-V host and we have also our backup software running on this host as a virtual machine. It's also a speciality. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, you can do that. Um, so if we show Hyper-V here, yeah, you see on our system is our Veeam backup, um, backup server running. We're, yes. That was DG just showing, right? Okay. Yep. Okay. Here we are. So back that, again. So that is initializing the storage at the moment. So that's good. Uh, what's perhaps also interesting to know is that uh, with, uh, with 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 uh, the NICs that uh, Carson just uh, showed, they were in a, a set uh, team, so it's a switch embedded teaming. Mm -hmm. So it's not a, an ordinary NIC team. Now some. Some people might worry, is that performant? Well, actually, as the moment you go over 10 gig, 25 gig, 50 gig, and 100 gig, they are more performant than, uh, let's say, traditional teaming, because traditional teaming isn't exactly being developed for those kinds of workloads. Mm. So there's no worry there. So we are kicking off, I guess, five parallel uh, backups here, right? Yes. Hang on. Let me, go, let me go to the other one. Those, that should also be Same. doing five. Yeah. Yes, uh, you could do all ten, and we've experimented with it. And as long as your 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 source systems and your target system can handle the the load, it doesn't really matter. But doing too many simultaneously in production would normally be a bit of a uh, a show uh, showstopper for your production environment. Yeah. Latency might become too big. So basically, this is uh, all you can eat, but you have to be, let's say, wise about it. You don't want to be puking in the toilet afterwards. So yeah. moderate yourself and enjoy lunch, but don't eat everything uh, you find in one go because you, you're not going to feel well. Right. And it's the same for backups. So maybe you click on one. You click on one. Uh, it has started copying the configuration files, which means it will start with the uh, disks quite soon. Let's see what we see here. Yeah, also copied. So the moment the disks kick in, it should become interesting. Maybe Let's you can show the load on the source. Yes. Maybe data on one, I think, is prepared for that. Yeah. Yep. So it's not too bad yet, but it is it copying disks already? Or... And down there we have the watch uh, cluster from uh, VM fleet. You see there the IOPS yeah. we are doing in the moment. Uh, so you can see the, the latency as well here, which is interesting. Very nice, yeah. Now it's picking up. Yeah. That's, we, so we have now four gigabytes per second. So the so backup it, top is it, one. Yeah. it has started uh, copying files, yeah. right? Disks, virtual disks. Mm -hmm. So this will pick up quite fast. The annoying thing is I, this, these forms are modal, so you have to close one to go to the other. So that's a, a call out to Veeam. Mm -hmm. Yes. Make it, or demos make it in modal. Nice. Then we can show them side by side, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so speed is picking up, 6.30 here. So let's take a quick peek at our target. Uh, okay, our target is apparently having to do a little bit of work. Yeah, it's 100% CPU load. Just well, had. Now it's going down. Huh? Yeah, it, it's it's got a peak, of course, but it it can be it can get quite heavy. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And it's uh, it's something to to watch out for. And it's not. And of course, you you do not see network connectivity here, because uh, this is not RDMA, right? This is the RDMA activity we're watching. Uh, data mover is TCP/IP, so it is not passing uh, any RDMA traffic. Yeah. 
So let maybe look at the source again. We okay, saw a source. high load on the on the um, yeah the source. So is we're, now... we're hammering the the source a bit, mm -hmm. and of course. As I said, you need to tweak this for your environment. Uh, this is not really, uh, let's say, a high performance cluster. It's a two node cluster with two times eight cores, I think. What do you uh, mean? We have 12 gigabyte of uh, of read from the two I, node cluster. You see it I know, but what if it was 16 nodes and it had 20 cores in each yes. CPU? And it was, you know, yeah. that's what I mean. Yeah. Well, everything is relative. Yeah, but 12 I gigabytes, mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but everything is relative. Yeah, I mean, that's is. that's the only thing I was saying. This this could be a lot more. Just saying. We, uh, could, yeah. But I'm I'm so I'm, Veeam pretty, is, I'm, I'm pretty uh, proud yeah. of my two uh, small uh, S2D nodes. <laughs> Veeam is chugging away. <laughs> and what can we see? What what can you see here? This is interesting, right? Yeah, that's so, a, that's a tiering going on, right? Yeah, all the data is coming in on your SSD tier, the performance tier. But as the performance tier uh, is also filling up, uh, data will be sent to the capacity tier, and that's what you see happening here. Yeah, it's it's reading. If you look here, the mouse, we are reading a lot of the SSD tier, the performance tier, and writing to the capacity tier or the HDD tier. So um, yep. some data is still coming in here, but it's not much, and then it will be moving. And uh, it's doing quite nice. So maybe you can show us Veeam again, where we are uh, yeah. with the backup speed. Mind the CPU, it's not too bad at the moment. So yeah. go to V. Oh, look at that. Speed 2.4 gigs, not too shabby, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of cool. And if we go to the source, what do we see? Our CPUs are chugging away, of course. Yeah, but we have 50, I, th I would say 50 to 80%, right? Yeah. Of course, Veeam is doing its magic and is uh, compressing this, you know, you know that's 23.6, which is, of course, the files in the VMs are very similar, so you can get a very high, uh, let's say, uh, compression and deduplication in, rate, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's, it's it's highly successful in this yeah. case. It is. So let's go back to our target. It's not writing anything in the moment, right? Well, I think it's done with the first batch, and now it's uh, launching the next five on the CSVs, and then it will mm -hmm. kick off again. So that's 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 a bit the aim. You you have to you have to tweak your backups that you don't do too many at once, but that you keep that pipeline filled up adequately. And normally in real life, at least with me, uh, you have multiple sources going to uh, one target, so it's end to one, so to speak. Uh, Normally, you will not build a backup target for just your one cluster, unless you only have one cluster. But if you have six, five, <laughs> 10, 12, 20, 100 clusters, I don't know, you can figure out how many clusters you can back up simultaneously to the same target. Do you see my dog? <laughs> I love it. <laughs> he wants to go out. He's bored. He wants to be. No, he <laughs> wants to be free. <laughs> so, um... So let's go back to, to Veeam and see what Veeam is doing. Yeah, so things have quieted down a bit. So the first have succeeded. So now it's just prepping the other ones, yeah. right? And it will be doing that for both jobs. Oh, take the one that's running. That might be helpful. Again, they have been successful. Hence, nothing is happening on the target. Now, if you had multiple clusters in action that are backing up, uh, Normally, your backups won't start all of them at the same moment for everything, so you would stagger them, and your pipeline would be filled up nicely. Yeah. But it's, yeah, I'm, it's I'm very quite sorry that I don't have so much hardware here. Ha! Ah, yes. To show it nicely. Well, well, next time we'll do it live in a in a thousand server data center or something. <laughs> okay. So. Um... But the interesting thing is, the moment it kicks off again, we'll we'll take a peek at those CPUs to see what's happening, and that's important to to look at if you want to compare it with uh, the backup target when we use it as a as a file share, yeah, right? Awesome because then came. RDMA will kick in because that's SMB3, and you can do uh, backups over SMB3 with RDMA yeah, right. because yeah, that will be on really our ne our next backup, right? Yeah. Now you see some data coming in. 
Yeah, and that means activity has resumed here. Yeah. Yeah, it's copying the configuration files at the moment. Mm -hmm. Let's look over here. Yeah, mm -hmm. so the configuration files, those are very small, so they should be done. And then it will start doing the disks, and then we will see activity again on the target, or at least a lot more activity on the target. Drum roll. This is the, the most annoying thing about doing demos, the timing. How do you yeah. get the timing exactly right? And do I have to keep babbling during the waiting periods to keep the audience entertained? I have no clue, actually. Yeah. Maybe this is annoying. It, I don't it know. Depends. So we should see here, you see 9.978 yeah. yeah. gigabit, right? Yeah, this is nice. Uh, we know where we have to look here, and the CPU is picking up again, so we get a, a, a lot of data ingestion. Yeah. yeah. And if we quickly go to Veeam, you should see that this is correct because the disks are actually being copied at the moment. Yeah. Right. That's what we see happening. And of course, our source is then again doing a lot of work. Yeah, and you can see the, the speeds we get are really nice, both on the source and on the target. So that's kind of cool. And keep in mind, the backup target is, is not a big system. There's not too many disks in there. Uh, no, actually, two we have six HDDs and two SSDs. Yes, that's it. Yeah. yeah. And that's quite nice, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so you you could you could say uh, of course you have to design your two tiers uh, with capacity and performance in mind. So your 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 performance tier cannot be too small. It's also not needed to make it too too big, but you need to figure out how to do that uh, to make sure that uh, you don't have any issues there. And uh, you could say that if you do this completely with SSD or NVMe, that would be overkill. On the other hand, the more backup jobs you send to the target, the more data it will have to ingest, and then it can be quite useful to have uh, NVMEs or SSDs in there. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of cool. 2.6 gigabytes per second in the moment. Yes. So this is the wrong one. Take the other one, data mover. Oh. 2.4 and 2.4. So this is nice. If somebody is still backing up over one gigabyte, I'm sorry, uh, maybe <laughs> gigabit, I mean, uh, you might want to upgrade your systems. Uh, but as you can see, if you can go upgrade to 10 gigabits, uh, that's already uh, a big win. But maybe if you still haven't upgraded to 10 gigabits, don't do that, go to 25. For the price, you should not, you know. Yeah, worry. even the 25 uh, gigabit cards are, down uh, downward compatible with the 10 gigabit SFP plus uh, ports. If you have yeah, still yeah, 10 I, gigabit switches, go yeah. for the 25 gigabit cards. Actually, actually, I have environments where I'm making that transition. So all new servers are 25 or better, yeah. but we uh, we hook them up to the 10 gigabit infrastructure. And when the 25 uh, or better switches come in, you just uh, plug them over and, and things will keep working. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of nice, uh, and vice versa, of course. If you are, if you first upgrade your network to 25, that will work with 10 gigabit cards as well. So, it's uh, it, there is no reason not to do it, and there is no reason that you should do it all, all everything on the same day, because you can't, uh, you know, have any com compatibility between the the two uh, speeds or so. So. But we're almost done here, actually. So yeah. traffic here should drop. CPU is over. Well, that's it. I think the backups are done. Success. One has stopped. They're, they're, they're all, all of them are stopped. So this is quite nice, right? Mm -hmm. So I kind of like this. We have 15 minutes or 14 minutes and 58 seconds. Processing rate is two gigabytes per second, and I think we have the same on the other uh, other job. I, right? I think so. That that, yeah. that was very close to each other. Yeah. yeah. And the throughput here, uh, it the top was 2.6 gigabytes per second, and then the other one it was 
maybe the same. Maybe you can click on the data mover again, the other one, the CSV2, uh, 2.5. So um, that's about five gigabytes per second tops. That's not bad. That's actually quite good. <laughs> okay. So, and, of, uh, and of course, we had a lot of success with our compression, etc. Yeah, that's. But that's also very good. Uh, um, a lot of data is um, compressed on the uh, on the on-host proxy on the Hyper-V nodes, and that that um, is also responsible for a lot of CPU load, right? So the question would be: yeah. Would be an off-host proxy better in this scenario? I don't think so. Right? Yeah, but to have an off-host proxy, you need uh, you need ISCO zero or FC yeah. in Hyper-V. So that's that's it. I I, use, I do that a lot because yeah. I have the environments where I can do that. Uh, it's 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 great because FC just like RDMA, everything I/O related is offloaded to the to the HBAs. Yeah. With yeah. iSCSI, of course, if you don't use a special iSCSI offload card, you still have the load on the server. And Microsoft's iSCSI, uh, let's say, initiator isn't perhaps the the most performant. It's a bit it's a bit old in the tooth, as they would say. It needs uh, it's it needs an upgrade, especially with the uh, with the 25, 50, 100 gig networking coming in. They might want to do some work on that one. Yeah. So I uh, kick I kick off the SMB3 backup, right? Yeah, kick them off. Because it takes well, it I'm... takes again a while. Uh, don't be disturbed. Yeah. Uh, to just start. Um, so. Um... But, with F, but with FC, as you mentioned, I had re I have really really nice uh, performance yeah. because actually I I make it so that the the repositories are also the off host proxies. So basically, the snapshots gets mounted on the yeah. on the backup. The server where the data need so there's no copying over the network anymore. Yeah. It's all within the server, and fiber channel is pretty effective, uh, expensive but pretty effective. So if you can do that, uh, it's uh, it's ideal because yeah. you offload all that work uh, away from your from your actual Hyper-V nodes. So they started here. Okay. Yes, they've started. Yes. Again, five and five. So yeah. let's talk a bit. We know it will take three to four minutes before we really uh, see the data moving. So let's talk about the setup uh, because we are using now sh a share. Uh, so we don't use the data mover. We, we use a share, the SIF share. Yeah. Um, and there is a speciality if your hosts can leverage RDMA. Um, uh, the source and the target can leverage RDMA. We use that. You have to tweak your setup in uh, Veeam a bit, yeah. But yeah, okay. here it's possible because this host, our our source hosts, are S2D uh, nodes, and in S2D, I strongly advise to use SMB Direct or SMB over RDMA. So we have that there, and our data on S2D4 is also uh, a host with the same network setup. So we have two. 50 gigabit ports in here, a Mellanox card, and it's uh, RDMA is yeah. configured and capable. And uh, we hopefully will see that we don't use the network here, but we use RDMA, and we will see some numbers here soon. Yeah. And, and 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 this is and this is not very expensive to do uh, to yeah. add to your backup targets. I mean, it's it's not more expensive than any other uh, network cards or dual yeah. port network cards. So why not? And uh, you could compare this with uh, with off host proxy. At, at in that scenario, you, you add an FC HBA or a dual port or two single mm -hmm. ports, whatever, to your backup target as well. And is it is and that's a lot more expensive actually than buying the the RDMA cards. So this is still very cost effective. So if somebody says, oh, but you have to have a special card, even the onboard cards nowadays that you can buy uh, tend to have RDMA. If you like those cards, that's a different story, of yes, course. No. Uh, you, 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 pick the one, you pick the ones you like <laughs> and you live with it. And if you can't live with it, you call us and we'll fix that for you. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> even if you have RDMA cards, you can always turn off RDMA and then they are normal network cards that do TCP IP and all this stuff. Exactly. So you switch so to the, yeah, I'm just where are we? Taking a peek. It's initializing storage, so it won't be too long anymore. Yeah. So in full anticipation, anticipation let's see what's happening on the, the source hosts. It's not, not being too hit much. too hard yet. Yeah, any time now. Yeah, let, let this picture stay a bit. So. 
When we come back, I want you to look here at the read. And this is uh, in uh, uh, watch cluster, you see the bandwidth. So uh, how much IO, uh, how mu much data is ingested or getting out of the system or moved in the system. And in the moment it's 30 megabytes per second. That's not much. But later, uh, we should see much higher numbers. And I mentioned it before, but we uh, didn't really look here. So yeah. um, we will see that later. So Didier wants to go here again. OK, now, it started copying the configuration files. So we yes. know that once those are done, uh, we'll uh, start working on the, the VHDXs. So that's uh, good news. We'll see traffic soon. No, now we there see it is. Traffic. So which host do go. you want to show? Sure, but take data on uh, oh, so uh, four, four. Yes. Then we can see that RDMA is working. So if you don't do it, I do it. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I thought you were asking, <laughs> not telling. One. So here you see now uh, our RDMA counters. If you are, if you have RDMA cards in your system, you should have the ADMR activity counters in the performance monitor. And here you see we have RDMA traffic and. Uh, this is the inbound traffic here. So that is 255 megabytes. And we see, we see data on both network cards, right? So yeah. we don't see so much CPU anymore that see, we had yeah, before, that, right? That, that, that huge spike you got at the beginning of the yeah. backup, that's gone. So that's kind of cool to see. And of course, you see that the data tearing is working out. But now let's look at the source, right? Yeah, on the source. Do you think we have a little bit less I.O. here? Uh, it, it's, it seems not much less, right? We don't have 20% now. We have still uh, se around 70. But it seems it's not it's not going as high as before. Oh? It, it looks that way, yeah. yeah. And if you look at your, your, uh, your little script in the it. below, yeah. because that's what you wanted us to look at. So yeah, now it's 11.7. 11.5 yep. gigabytes, so that's 9,000, 10,700 megabytes per second. And yep. it's all read, so we get that it's read from the storage in the system and uh, processed by the yeah. by the Veeam software yeah. on the host. And the, on the, on and the, the latency host. is still very nice. It's, uh, it's fantastic. The, the write latency yep. is not there, it's below one millisecond, and the read latency is... Still good if you move uh, 12 gigabytes per second or read 12 gigabytes yep. per second. That's fantastic. So, so now we go to Veeam again. You can have the mouse again, my friend. Okay. Oh, oh. golly. We share. Okay, so <laughs> we share the mouse. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> it's going to wind down very soon because I think most of the data will have been copied. So yeah, 78, 76. So the speed here yeah. is the same as with the data mover. Yeah, we've we've actually we've we've actually tried uh, more VMs and then uh, it all just keeps working and it's it's amazing to see how much uh, data you can or how how many how the backup capacity let's say that you can move in a short amount of time yeah. uh, with with these systems. It's really and that's not saying, and I, I'm not saying that uh, using storage spaces is the only thing you can do for backup targets or for or for for clustering, but it's it's good to know that it's there and it's good to know it's in the box and it's good to know that it's available. So yeah. I'm not, I'm really never trying to convert the entire world to storage spaces. I'm just pointing it out to people that it's there, and for your use cases, it might be an excellent choice. So yeah. why not look at it? Yeah. Uh, and especially with the backup, because one thing I always want to mention is people say, oh, but storage spaces only works with uh, data center edition, which is true for S2D because it's clustering, uh, the clustering functionality is only available in a data center. But for the backup target, no, it is not. This is standard edition. Now, this is actually a data center edition, but it could run on a standard oh, edition. I, I'll, I'll put it this way. In my, in my labs, it's yeah. standard edition, and I, I do that on purpose to, to point out to people like, hey, no, you don't need to pay data center license for a backup target. You're completely but, right. Ed. So this, this could be standard edition, but we will, for our next video, take this host and uh, with another host, we will uh, do an S2D target for our backup. Yeah. And I don't want to reinstall the operating system again. 
Yeah, because because I want to mention something here, and I've actually written an article on that uh, on the Starwine blog, uh, uh, and that is about uh, potential risks with a, an SMB uh, backup target. SMB3, uh, let's say in its general form, is uh, highly effective and highly performant, and it's actually quite good if your network is very decent. But if if there is one thing I learned from talking to a lot of people, uh, especially to Gustav is that a lot of NICs have bugs as well, and firmware and drivers have bugs as well. And uh, your data might not arrive on your target uh, as much and, or as well as you think it does. And SMB3 is actually quite good at it because it's, it's let's say, the, the, the main purpose is file sharing. And if you use Word or Excel or PowerPoint, you're actually pretty decent at dealing with little hiccups. So basically, SMB3 will lie and tell you, hey, the data is here and everything is hunky-dory and it doesn't really matter if you if you have a little issue because everything is in temp files, everything is cached, etc., etc. But with backup targets, when your target says, hey, the data is here, it has to be there because if you miss a little bit, you have corrupt data chains and then you can't restore, which is the main purpose of backing up anyway. So you want to avoid that. Uh, so building a very good network that isn't flaky is one thing, but if you really want a high assurance that uh, the data is valid on the other side, uh, it is uh, recommended to make sure that SMB works in write through. Now you can do write through today with uh, a non high available file share, but then you have to map it as a drive letter. And that is a bit uh, annoying because you don't want to do that for your backups. You want to go to that SIFS file share that you configured in Veeam. So for the backups uh, parts, it's not the ideal solution. So we've asked Microsoft, please make give us the opportunity to say when you define uh, a file share as a backup target or whatever to a SIFS, uh, to, sorry, to UNC pod, that you can tell it, hey, this has to be used in write through. Right now, the other way to do that is to make it highly available in a cluster. The continuous availability part of uh, SMB3 file clustering will take uh, care of that for you and guarantee that your data is correct on the other side, or at least arrived correctly on the other side. Hold, this hold is one thought, uh, DJ, hold your thought. I just okay. want to mention we have now a lot of data ingestion, and we don't okay. see the high speed as uh, uh, spikes here with the CPU with uh, that we saw with the data mover, right? Yeah, so that is an excellent. advantage, but you pointing out a disadvantage if you have a flaky network. Um, that you might want to protect against that yeah. by uh, using Y2 on SMB3. And yeah. as we mentioned, you, you can have it sort of today on a standalone system, but it's not ideal for every use case. Mm -hmm. But the continuous availability uh, offers you that protection. And uh, two things. Uh, one, it's continuous available, so you can lose a cluster node and your backups will just have a little pause but they will keep working i made videos on that which is really awesome if you need high available backup systems mm -hmm. uh, but the other thing you need to keep in mind is that it comes at the cost of performance uh, the thing is if you have all flash uh, backup targets or mirror accelerated backup targets that cost is there but it's not hurting you too much because you have enough iops and throughput uh, anyway so you can afford to lose some mm -hmm. right so that's 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 the idea, uh, but you still keep your benefits of RDMA, low CPU overhead. You have your protection against data corruption, and you get high availability in the backup target. And for some people, you might say, "Hey, I, I don't care if my backup target is down two hours a day uh, because it because it had a, an issue with a with a dim slot or a memory." Uh, dim that had to be replaced or whatever. But if you are building this as a service to a lot of uh, customers or tenants, you might be very interested in high available backup mm -hmm. targets. And that might make sense again for you. So depends yeah. on your needs. And we will look at that in, in the next uh, Hyper-V Amigo showcast yeah. and that maybe we will also turn off a node while backing up. Yeah, yeah that's that's exactly the idea. <laughs> oh, and there is perhaps one little uh, extra benefit you could mention about backing up to storage spaces. If you, as a target, right, uh, if you format it with REFS, 
storage space disparity with RUFS gives you data corruption protection because it can rebuild the uh, any corrupt blocks on the on the on the fly from the parity in the storage space. Yeah. So that's a benefit that you won't have if you, if you use RUFS with a RAID controller. That's supported for for those use cases, but you don't have that rebuild and protection against bit rot. So yeah. Again, uh, one reason why you might consider using storage spaces. Uh, I've, I've had people uh, show me some concern around the stability and uh, the, let's say the, the quality of storage spaces. Uh, I, I've had my issues, especially in the beginning, because one, I was learning, two, there were some bugs. But nowadays, I, I can say that if you do it well, it's uh, it's a reliable system. Is it as is it as fine honed as with with fancy GUIs as some people or some vendors have? No, uh, but there are. This is improving. Yeah. You're getting more and more capabilities, and I think Karsten is perhaps one of the best examples that storage spaces doesn't ruin your company because I think he has over 100 deployments, right? Ah, it's uh, over 200. <laughs> over two. Well, uh, we I'm, I'm over being too honest already. Again. Over and yeah, I, you are right. In the beginning, with all software, if we look back to uh, 2016 when storage bases came out, there were some hiccups. And of course, with the new version 2019, if you start uh, late in uh, 2018 when it came out, there were some hiccups because a lot, Microsoft changed a lot in storage bases direct. But nowadays, uh, you can uh, you can really implement 2019 uh, well, and 2016 is rock solid. So if you do it right, that's the important part here. If you yeah. if you do it right, it's a rock solid system. But come on, it's with every system the same way. If you don't do yeah, it absolutely. right, yeah. you're playing with uh, <laughs> your company's yeah. uh, well-being, right? So yeah, it's, it's what do we like, see here? That we see that it uh, the performance was very good, 2.8 and. 2.6, and it's yeah. slightly faster than the data mover, but not that much. But the benefits are also, of course, in the, the CPU offloading over here. Yeah. Uh, so that's something you have to keep in mind. I I think we um, we we saw that the CPUs on the target on the um, SMB or on the on the backup target was really not there. With the data mover, yeah, we had that, also in the beginning 100%. That big, that big spike yeah. you get, uh, it wasn't there. That was yeah. for sure, yeah. But on the on Which, the source, I think there's even some, not much, but you you, you use a little benefits. bit less uh, CPU there. Yeah. 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 So. Okay. I this, this, this is this is nice. This is a nice setup. This is a nice demo. I I think it is. It works very well, and um, um, I'm I'm curious. Uh, what the people think. So use the comment function uh, below the video on the Hyper-V Amigo showcast site. And uh, I think we will do very soon uh, the setup with the uh, two STD, S2D nodes as a target. And yeah, we and what we should also actually do yeah. is, is do restore, an instant recovery. If you want because to one, do that. What, well, one one of the well, we'll do it in one of the next because we don't want to make this too long. Yeah. But one of the benefits of having a, a highly performant backup target is that the moment you do instant recovery, you need, of course, uh, a fast target to restore it to, which would be your Hyper-V cluster. Uh, you have a fast network, so you don't have any issues there with bandwidth and latency, but you also want a very fast uh, backup uh, target where your backups are residing because during that fast recovery, you're actually running from, from the backup bits, right? Mm -hmm. So the faster that backup target is, the faster your restores will be, which is one of the reasons also why you might not want to use dedupe on your, uh, let's say, most recent backups because then you have you don't have the, the dedupe or the deduplication overhead, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But that's something we'll also look at. Look at uh, oh, yeah. Nice that you mentioned that we could uh, we could use deduplication here. We didn't do that we on could. purpose, uh, but yeah. you could uh, also with a standalone host with storage spaces and ReFS uh, or with NTFS. Um, we can use deduplication. It's in uh, Windows Server uh, now built in, uh, and yeah. there you would have some savings. But of course, there are some drawbacks. Uh, also, um, yeah. it's maybe not as fast as um, as without deduplication, and uh, if you want to do a restore of a CSV 
let's say the CSV has deduplication uh, on, on the source, and you have maybe 20 terabyte in a 10 terabyte uh, volume, and for some reason it, it, it got corrupted or it's deleted or whatever, you can't restore it immediately because yeah. 20 terabyte doesn't doesn't fit in 10 terabyte, right? You have to do it, no, in, it in phases, right? Restore maybe a nine terabyte, then dedupe them, and then restore another four and dedupe them, and and so on. Yeah, and then some people might say, oh, you need solutions that do inline dedupe, so you don't have to worry about that, yeah. which is kind of true pure, 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 from a pure technical point of view. But again, most of those things are very expensive, so yeah. that's another thing. This is and not expensive, I, by the way. And and dedupe, dedupe is something like. Uh, it's a tool in my toolkit, and I use it where I need it. But it's not—it's not something that I have. Uh, I, I let's say manically enable everywhere I go. It's not—it's not a, a mantra-like thing. I have to have dedupe everywhere. Yeah. I, I only use dedupe when it serves a purpose, and sometimes that purpose is uh, not there, and that's 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 valid, right? So I fear my. Video is now Can frozen. No, 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 there it's you're, back you're, again. You're, you're working again, so people okay. will think you fell asleep for for five and seconds. That's that. I, okay. I had a I had a small second sleep. So, okay. I think we are done but with let's this. Quit, let's quit. Let's quit here. Yeah. And keep the, the remainder of the goodies for the next one. We do that. So Didier, was a nice one. See you soon for the next video, right? Should we mention where they can find us in Europe uh, in November? In November, what's in November? Ah, yeah, there is the Experts Live Europe, right? <laughs> yeah, so you, you, you have the opportunity and a chance to meet Karsten live, ask yes. him questions, and talking did. about his video, yes. and me as well. Yes. If you're interested in RDMA, you know, I'm an RDMA addict. If you're interested in persistent memory, I'm a, I'm a very new persistent memory addict, addict. actually. <laughs> uh, there is something coming up here, And if you buy the passes, too. you get, get, yeah. you get to have a drink with us or something, right? So there is a nice conference, the Experts Live uh, Europe, uh, happening this year in Prague in November. And uh, Didier and I, we will, we are speaker there. Didier, for you, is the first time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's I think yeah. it's the seventh time or so. Um, I don't know why I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a legacy guy, and uh, I'm speaking there, and you are a legacy too, right? I'm very legacy, especially yeah. at that conference, because <laughs> I'm doing Hyper-V backups. But yeah. of course, but what I always say to everybody uh so everybody's doing cloud nowadays yeah even i am doing cloud nowadays you're doing cloud as well you're even an azure mvp now yeah I'm, so I'm... <laughs> for some reason i think it's not like legacy guys are not doing cloud that's no. not true no. but the legacy guys of course know that you can't just switch the entire world over from the legacy to the new stuff in uh, the blink of an eye and you will have legacy if you want to call it that for a very long time and that's fine. That's perfectly fine as long as you have a plan uh, going ahead because you didn't have virtualization 20 years ago in the, in the Windows world. You've had it. Now you still have it. And as long as you have it, you will have to protect it and take care of it. Hence, I still uh, take care about all kinds of things like storage, networking, backup. And I will talk about how how Hyper-V backups work and how they have improved over time and how you should leverage them today to the best of your ability and make the most of it because they are not gone yet. Yeah, it's very. That's what I dislike perhaps the most about the cloud is that there is a lot of uh, hype going on and people pretend that there is nothing else. And I kind, I, I, I don't kind of, you know, I don't really appreciate colleagues that say, oh, we're in the cloud now. So we don't bother anymore with anything the company has. I'm like, exactly. dudes, dudes, exactly. Uh, this still exists. It still makes money. You still need to protect it and take care of it. Yeah. It's fine to be there, but you have to help with the entire breadth and depth of the company because you just can't abandon stuff because you found a new big thing. If I would and do I that, I would be playing with BMAM all day long <laughs> and forget about <laughs> the existence of SSDs. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and uh, I, I got the notion that hybrid is the thing to go, not cloud only, and in hybrid we have on-prem and we have cloud and everything is fine. But now, um, shout out to Experts Live Europe, it's happening in Prague, I think in mid-November, um, and Didier, we will see very soon in Prague before that, uh, in October, right? 
but that's yes, not an, not an, an, an open event uh, we will we will meet uh, some other beam vanguards and uh, we'll learn about some new stuff that will be nice so but let's finish here thanks for watching or do you want uh, some uh, last no, words I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm waving to the audience <laughs> so bye-bye see you soon see you next time